I am an unbelievably obsessive compulsive person. Like I'm anal retentive. It's, it's a superpower and a villain origin story all wrapped up into one. Um, when it comes to excellence, I know exactly what right looks like and I want everyone to do it exactly that way all the time. And, um, yet at the same time, I love creating cultures of ownership and empowerment. And I know that people bring their best selves to the job when they feel they have the ability to creatively impact the work itself. And those two things do not go together well at all. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. Hey, I'm so glad you joined us. And if you're new here, subscribe. We have the one and only Will Gadara. And we're going to talk about handling criticism and praise, also collaboration and control, how his book became a top-selling book. It was really about leadership in the restaurant industry, but it's become a perpetual bestseller. Well, today's episode is brought to you by Belay. This month is your last chance to get Belay's latest resource, The Power of Productivity. If you want to become more productive as a leader, there are all kinds of practical tips inside. To claim it, just text my name, Carrie, C-A-R-E-Y, to 55123. They'll get it directly in your hands. And now, my conversation with Will Gadara. Will, welcome back. Thank you, man. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, I have been too. It's like when when you show up on my calendar, I'm like, oh yes, this is going to be a good day. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to continuing this. And as I said to you earlier, the only bummer this year was for once I didn't make it to the Global Leadership Summit where you mm-hmm. spoke, and uh, it would have been good to connect in person, but soon. Uh, well, your book, Unreasonable Hospitality, when you were first on the show, it had just come out. Yeah. Um, Surprisingly, even though it's about hospitality, it's become a huge hit in church circles, leadership circles, probably beyond, maybe you had that in mind the whole time. Maybe it's gone a little bit beyond that. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to why you think it might be resonating with so many people who are not running restaurants. You know, um, it's interesting because, yeah, it's gone much further than I expected uh, it to go as far as I hoped it would go. Um, because when I wrote it, it I, I always assumed that my industry, the restaurant industry would, would embrace it. Um, mm-hmm. but my hope was that other industries would too, because I mean, listen, I, I, one of my favorite things to say is I don't care what you do for a living. You can make the choice to be in the hospitality industry. It simply requires a refocusing of priorities and the choice to be as, relentless, creative, intentional, all of that in pursuit of people and relationships as so many successful people are in pursuit of the product or service that they're offering. Um, and, and so it's, it's been, been pretty cool. Like I, I found myself spending time with hospital networks and retirement home communities and NFL teams and major banks and, and then, yeah, a, a lot of time with the church. And I think I think that last one, like the church, it, it does make a lot of sense. I was mm. I was at a place called Refuge, you know, you know, Brian Carpenter, or do you know Refuge? Actually, I don't think I do, no, but probably so should. Refuge is an amazing place, started by this uh, a buddy of mine named Brian Carpenter. Um there was just one in Montana for a long time. Now they have a outpost in Montana and in Wyoming. And Brian was a youth pastor in San Diego um, Hmm. years and years ago. And somehow he transitioned from that to starting this place where um, pastors would go to get away from their congregations and be with other pastors. And in doing so, just be given give themselves the grace, be given the grace to actually be fully human Mm. with one another and have a little whiskey, smoke a cigar, go fishing and talk about the things they were struggling with as opposed to only the things that those around them were struggling with. And Mm. um, I don't think this is a pastor specific thing. I think it's a leader thing where, 
whether it's self-imposed or imposed upon us from the world where there's this belief that you're not allowed to be human and you're not allowed to be imperfect and you're not allowed to admit to making mistakes or all of that. And if you don't allow yourself to be human, you start to run out of gas pretty quickly. And when you're out of gas, you have nothing left to give. And so refuge was started as this place for pastors to take refuge and refill their gas tanks and, and emerge ideally better equipped and re-energized to serve their communities. Mm. Um, and then over time it still plays that role, but then there's other weeks where just leaders gather. Um, and so one of my best friends from growing up, his name is Adam LaRoche, a retired baseball player. He and I host a trip once a year. and We were out there um, and there were a couple pastors on the trip and everyone knew I was going to do global leadership. And we were just talking about that. And I was asking them for advice on how to frame Reverend Marks. And, uh, one of the guys on the trip, this guy, Scott was like, you know, I'm so glad you're speaking there because shouldn't churches be the most hospitable places on earth? Mm -hmm. Um, and listen, I think relationships are relationships. The lessons you learn from those in life can be applied to those in work and, and vice versa. But gosh, if relationships are important anywhere, they're very, very important within the church community. And I just think this idea of being creative and intentional in pursuit of all the different relationships of all the different stakeholders it's just a powerful thing. And so I have to imagine why that's why people have kind of felt a connection to the book and it's been honoring and, and it's been just a pleasure to spend time with them. I completely agree with you that churches should be the most hospitable place on earth. And if you look at the first century church, that's one of the most plausible arguments as to why it grew. It wasn't marketing. It wasn't budgeting. It wasn't incredible preaching, although there was some incredible preaching. It was ordinary people taking people who are different than they were into their homes, loving them, um, taking care of the castaways. I mean, it was a pretty stratified society and breaking down race and class and ethnicity and religion to, to sort of embrace. You, you can really make the argument that hospitality was one of the reasons the early church actually thrived in the decades after Jesus' resurrection. Fast forward to today, I don't know why this popped into my head, but when I was looking at churches that I might be able to serve at, there was a church not too far from here that had like 30 people at it on a Sunday morning, and they invited me and my wife to come up, and I was, quote, auditioning, I was preaching to see if they would take me on. This is when I was a seminary student in Toronto. And I remember going down to the church basement for coffee hour, and there was a little huddle, Will, of like 15, 20 people who stayed for coffee, and it was, it was a literal circle. And I remember standing there with my wife and our two-year-old, 18-month-old, in arms, waiting for someone to talk to us. Mm -hmm. And nobody talked to us. And you know, when you're standing close to the circle, you try to break in. <laughs> I, I couldn't break in. And I'm like, wait a minute. I was the guy at the front with the microphone preaching to you, and you're theoretically auditioning me. And we literally turned around, and nobody talked to us. We couldn't break the circle, and we got into our car. And as soon as I shut the door, I said to my wife, yeah, we're not going there. I'm yeah. withdrawing. Mm. I'm withdrawing. And and I wish I could say that was an isolated episode. <laughs> it's not an isolated incident. Any idea why people are not hospitable? And I mean, we've had that story. You, everybody's had that story in restaurants. You've had it on airplanes where the flight crew doesn't seem to be delighted to be there. Uh, but we become very insular. We become yeah. on, in, inhospitable. Why does that happen? I mean, so I think it's important to make the distinction that, and this is the charitable assumption, because obviously you never know. Yeah. But they weren't actively keeping you out. Mm. They just weren't actively inviting you in. And I and I think there's I think there's a big difference mm. between those two, right? And 
Um, I think a lot of, I mean, I'm going to back up and this is going to be circuitous, but I'm going to get to the, the question. My longtime boss, forever mentor, Danny Meyer used to say, mm-hmm. hospitality is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. Um, there are those that speak at people versus those that speak with people. There are those whose viewpoints are thrust upon others. And there are those who are curious and engage in conversation. And I, and I think to be genuinely hospitable, you need to be curious. Mm. Um, I know I have so many friends who are very involved in the church and, um, and through that I've met other people who are, are not friends, they're acquaintances. And of that group, when I hear people talk about Jesus Christ, there are those that walk into a room as if they're walking onto a stage. Mm-hmm. And they start talking to the group like, hey, I am here to save you. And this is da 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 And when they're done talking, it's almost as if the conversation is over. And then there are those that are very, very curious about what other people believe. And let's have like a really good conversation. I'd love to share with you. I'd love to learn from you. Um, obviously people are much more inclined to want to engage in conversation with the latter than they are with the former and, Mm. um, and they are doing that because when they feel someone is curious about what they believe, they are intrinsically more curious than what the other person believes. Back to the circle. They might not have been actively trying to keep you out, but they weren't actively trying to invite you in and in order for someone to be inclined to actively try to invite you in, they need to be inherently curious. What does this person think? What do they have to say? Who are they? What can I learn from them? What do they have to offer? Um, And so I don't think it represents like, that someone's a bad person. They just, for whatever no. reason, aren't inclined to want to engage. And one of the things I, I, when I was coming up, I would always hear people say that you hire for hospitality and you train for excellence. So almost as if to say that some people are hospitable, some people are not. Hire the ones that are. Train that habit of good. And obviously, when you're hiring someone, hire the most hospitable people you can. But this underlying idea that some people are hospitable and some people are not, I think is fundamentally incorrect. I think we all have hospitality in us. We just need to have someone who inspires it out of us. I think hospitality is a craft. It's a muscle you can strengthen. And I think curiosity is too. Um, I think more people and more communities need to be inspired to be curious and they need to strengthen the mess, the muscle of curiosity. Um, because the more curious you are, the more curious you become. This is going to sound like a question out of left field, but I'm going somewhere. What was the average age at 11 Madison Park? What was the average age of your staff? Oh, gosh, like 26. 26. I was going to say, they're not 52, no. right? No. 26. How do you, how do you train Um a non-curious, non-hospitable person to become hospitable? Mm. Well, you don't start with training. I think I always talk about leaders versus managers. Managers train, leaders inspire, right? Like Mm. you can't train someone who doesn't care about hospitality. You need to inspire them to care about hospitality and then train them to be hospitable. Okay. okay. But you need to start by inspiring them. And I think that's like, I've worked with so many companies and they want me to come in and like put together a training program and almost as if it's like plug and play. In two days, you will be hospitable. Yeah. And I think what, what, 
gets talked about is what gets thought about. Passion is contagious. And, and yeah, like it's, it's no, it's not dissimilar to like, what is a preacher getting up there and doing? They're talking about something with every ounce of their passion, with every ounce of their being, they're screaming it from the mountaintops, right? In hopes that someone in one of those chairs will, will be infected by their passion. Um, and yeah, we need to do that with hospitality too. Mm. So you inspire first, you yeah. train second. Maybe if you, if you don't mind, and I know you've got the whole book about it, but I'd love to, <laughs> to drill down on it. Um, talk to me about inspiring a young leader. Because, you know, the other thought that really comes with me in hiring that I think about more and more as I get older is a lot of us echo the system, the culture into which we were born, right? Mm. You were fortunate. You talked so much about your dad in the most admiring terms. You were mentored by Danny Meyer. I mean, you had great influences in your life that took whatever nascent curiosity you might have had as a child and kind of fanned it into flame. Some people come from the opposite culture in their in their family where nobody was hospitable where people ate tv dinners and stared at the tv and didn't talk to each other and weren't very outward focused so you have a whole variety of people with their incoming stories at 24 25 26 yeah starting with you in your restaurant what does inspiration look like when you have a mixed mixed crowd well i think that um I like your your metaphor, fanning into flame. Like the one thing just to say is I believe everyone has at least an ember of this in them and maybe you just need a fan longer and harder to get it to ignite. But I, I think that's something just that I believe anyway. Hmm. I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, yeah. The metaphor didn't start with me, but it is a good metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I... I for me, the greatest opportunity for inspiration comes in a daily huddle. And I, I've, mm-hmm. I talk about the power of a pre-meal in a restaurant all the time, that 30-minute mm-hmm. meeting we have right before we open the doors and try to encourage anyone, no matter what they do, no matter how big their team is, if you don't have some version of a daily huddle, you are leaving one of the most beautiful um, tools that we have at our disposal um, off to the side because... A daily huddle is an opportunity for a leader to actually like step up and lead and to inspire. And so in the case of a restaurant, you're doing that for whatever, 40 people in a literal circle, Hmm. like the one that would not let you in. (laughs) (laughs) The one that wouldn't let me in. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And, and I always, there's a couple things I always tell people when they're leading a a pre-meal. One is, your energy is there to impact theirs, not the other way around. Mm. Um, and that's for a very specific reason. I always talk about people's facial expressions are not an accurate depiction of how engaged they are in what you're saying. Um, for example, when I'm really engaged with someone's message, I look like this. <laughs> And for people <laughs> who are too. just listening, me too. For people uh-huh. who are not watching us, I just gave a facial expression of profound disinterest, and it's just <laughs> it's just what my face does when I'm really focused. And um, and one of the things we can do when we're trying to inspire a group is we catch on to someone who's looking at us like that, and because we don't think they're into what we're saying, we start to second guess our message and retreat a little bit and allow our passion to withdraw. And, um, so, A, your message, your energy is there to impact others, not the other way around. And I think if you really own that, it's one of the most powerful things you can do because you stop caring about what you're feeling from them and you only care about what you're trying to get them to feel. Um, but the second thing is you can't, this is not the right way to say it, but it'll make sense. You can't play to the lowest common denominator. Mm. Um. I've heard so many times, and I think everyone has this experience, like when you're having a more emotional, intentional conversation around the dinner table or 
you're playing one of those games where you're articulating appreciation for one another. Even the guy that feels like giving off, I'm too cool for this energy. They're often the ones that appreciate it the most at the end of it. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. Whereas if you play to them, instead of all the people that do seem really engaged, you're not getting anyone excited about what you're trying to, to deliver. Um, I think the third thing is don't be scared of being cheesy. Don't try to be cool. Rather, be the person that defines what is cool. Make your message the thing that's cool. Um, anyway, I guess my point is like, yeah, just go out there and like allow yourself to be genuinely passionate about what you believe. And if you are consistently, repetitively, because repetition matters, um, I've always been astounded at the change you see in those around you. I don't know. What do you think when I talk about that? I think like, you're right. I heard years ago that one of the best things a leader brings to his or her team is their energy. Yeah. And I think that's true because we have mopey days. I have mopey days. You didn't sleep particularly well or you're just feeling down or something. And it's easy to let that infect and affect the team. And the other thing I think is really important, Will, is what you said is repetition. I just got back from a business conference and that came up again and again. You know, Horst Schultze, who's been a guest on this podcast from the Ritz-Carlton talks a lot about what is it, the 26 mantras that they have. And every day there's a team meeting, the daily huddle. And I think often as leaders, we assume the vision, we assume the mission, we assume the culture. And I think that's that's a problem. So I would echo that. And and I think you're right. When, when you know, what, what I almost hear you saying is, uh, this is as much caught as taught. Mm -hmm. And if you see other people get infected and affected in a positive way by that hospitality, even the most cynical person in the room is going to be moved by it and go, oh, we have permission to do this, or I'm, I'm learning a new system here, or I can bring out that side of me. So that really does resonate. But it's, it's a reminder to weary leaders, if you've been doing this for a few minutes, that it is your energy you've got to bring to the team and it is the reminder of the mission, vision, and the culture that you want to create. I think it's also, we all want to be inspired. I mean, you look at how many millions of views are on TED Talks. Mm -hmm. TED Talks are successful because way too many people out there don't have anyone who is inspiring them in their lives. And so they go online to find it. Like, <clears throat> we're craving inspiration. And, okay, you have that if you're lucky in one of your parents. Maybe, maybe you have a friend in your life that is inspirational and maybe they somehow feel comfortable inspiring you as a friend. And that's a weird dynamic. Um, I just think like we all crave inspiration. And if you're a leader, why can't it be you that makes the choice to give it to people? Um, I think it's an opportunity that leaders have. I, I think it's actually a responsibility that leaders have, but Every leader also has some amount of imposter syndrome. And when you do, sometimes you start to question, well, who am I to be the one that inspires them? Well, you are their boss. You're the leader of this community. You are in this position for a reason. So seize the mantle. Of all the ideas in unreasonable hospitality, and it sold a lot of copies, you know, the hot dog story has really become... <laughs> Very well known. We're at the number one restaurant in the world. People just, I'll give people the nutshell so you don't have to tell it again for the 80th <laughs> time. Uh, but at this number one beautiful restaurant in the world, uh, business executives are sitting around saying the one thing they didn't get is a dirty hot dog. You or the team run out into the street, grab one off a hot dog vendor for literally $2.00 slice it up against the chef's protestations and deliver it to them. And it makes the makes their day, right? Yeah. It's unreasonable. It's hospitality. That's become very well known. 
what, what are the ideas that have most caught on from the book? And then what are the most misunderstood ideas? You're like, oh, no, that's not what I was saying. I meant uh, this. Oh. Every author has that, right? Gosh, that's the first time anyone's asked me that. Um, <sighs> I mean, the, the, the ideas that have most caught on, caught on are the smallest gestures can have the biggest impacts. Um, hospitality isn't about how much you spend on someone. It's about how thoughtful you are. It's about how these philosophies cannot take root in an organization um, unless you truly empower everyone on your team. Um, because this is not a one-person operation. It's a team operation. Everyone needs to feel the autonomy to do what's right. And I think that last one, anyone who's ever called a customer service hotline with a complaint can relate to because it doesn't matter how hospitable the rules are if the people on the front line who you're actually talking to aren't able to do anything for you the exchange is going to feel inhospitable <laughs> um maybe better said it doesn't matter how hospitable the rules are if the people you're engaging with are only empowered to follow a strict list of rules mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. let's see the the things perhaps most often miss most often misunderstood i mean thankfully this is not easy for me to answer which means that there haven't been like one or two things that have been like grating at me but well that's good one of the things i remind people of most often <clears throat> is I talk about hospitality versus excellence. And I mean, effectively, the book is saying hospitality is more important than excellence, right? Like, if you mm -hmm. really want to, mm -hmm. I don't actually say that anywhere in the book, but if someone read the Cliff's Notes, they might walk away with that. And, that, and appropriately so, because I use the Maya Angelou quote, doesn't matter what you, they won't remember what you say, they won't remember what you do, they're going to remember how you make them feel. And so hospitality is the thing that will leave them feeling something. Mm -hmm. um, but in spite of that, it doesn't mean that excellence isn't extraordinarily important. In fact, it's a prerequisite to all the ideas of unreasonable hospitality. You can't have dessert until you eat your vegetables, right? Like, And so I think that's one thing where people start skipping the excellence step and in doing so lose the very foundation upon which unreasonable hospitality is built. Um, the second one is similar to that, which is I talk about the rule of 95-5 in the book. It's my approach to managing finances, which is manage your money like a maniac 95% of the time, such that 5% of the time you can spend it foolishly. Um, that idea has got a lot of traction. I've heard that repeated back to me numerous times. Oh, that's cool. That's fun to hear. Um, yet in spite of that, I think some people like to just jump to the 5% and skip over the 95%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll manage 5% maniacally yeah. and do what we want 95% of the time. Or, or yeah. just say, like, we, we can't afford to do this stuff. And well, I know you need to earn the right to do it. And everyone can afford it. You just need to tighten your belt in some areas such that you can open up your wallet in other areas. And um, I'd say those are the two things that maybe require a little bit of reinforcing. Is there, oh, I mean, I've written a few books myself and it's funny how people focus in on certain aspects of what you wrote and I can think of my last two books and it's like, it's the same stuff coming back to me over and over and over again. Um, and part of me is like, well, my favorite, my two books ago, didn't see it coming. My favorite was the seventh section on emptiness. How do you overcome after you've had success, this feeling of emptiness? I'm like, I was so excited writing it. Nobody ever talks to me about that. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe they never read to the end. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But I'm like, oh, that was like such a such a work of art, and you guys are ignoring it in favor of cynicism and burnout. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but is there a, a neglected part of unreasonable hospitality where you're like, oh, I wish this saw more daylight? Uh, this is a little gem that even those of you who have read it may have missed. Um, no, you know, I think maybe to the contrary. I expected. 
I expected everyone to talk about like the last third of the book and kind of never really acknowledge that much about the first two thirds of the book. Um, but I didn't feel like you could write the last third of the book without the foundation of the first two thirds, not just the narrative foundation, but the, the ideological foundation. Um, and yet when I hear people talk about the things they feel the most connected with there, a lot of them are surprisingly kind of spread throughout. I think one of the things that maybe I get frustrated in conversation, frustrated is not the right word, but one of the things that I think is so, so, so important to create a culture of hospitality is for a leader to create a culture where feedback is normalized. Mm. Um, by normalized, I, I mean not only well received, but sought out. And I, I talk about, yes, praise is a very important part of that. Obviously, you set high expectations when people meet or, or exceed those expectations. You better be there to praise them. You better be praising your team all the time. People crave affirmation. Again, even the ones that give off too cool for school energy, they crave it too. I um, do. Praise is such a big part of what makes a culture great. And yet, sometimes I fear that in pursuit of praise, we've lost sight of how fueling an emotion or fueling an exercise criticism can be. Because if praise is affirmation, criticism is investment. Um, criticism is uncomfortable for the giver and the receiver. And yet I think there are a few things someone can do that are more generous than being willing to step outside of their comfort zone for long enough to invest in someone else's growth. And in the book, I go through all the rules of criticism because I think if you don't follow the rules, it's not actually thoughtful and by definition not constructive. But something I've been struck by is how many people want to tell me to use a, a different word. They don't like the word criticism hmm. um, because they believe it brings with it negative connotations. And, and that is normally where I will, th this is one position that I've, I've had enough conversations around where I will entrench myself in the position because I think that's the reason to use that word. Hmm. Um, I think we dance around criticism to the point where we need to re-articulate it for fear that it will be received in the wrong way. I think you need to call something what it is and then work to deliver it in a way that will be well-received. I would love to, that was going to be one of my things that I asked you about is praise is affirmation, criticism is investment. Um, so feel free to look at when you had the restaurant or what you're doing, you have a conference now, the welcome conference. I'm sure you get um, feedback on that, criticism on that. Um, and we just did our first live event in Dallas in September. And I thought the event went extraordinarily well. And then I started to read the survey. I'm like, please, please, please give us feedback. Yes. They had feedback. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Some stuff we missed. I still think it was a, it was a home run for for our first rodeo, but you know, it's like how how did you handle that as a leader? Because if if I have a theory, and I don't know, maybe you have a different theory. It's like a lot of us are a little more thin skinned than we let on, and it's just we feel too bad about ourselves. So therefore, it's easier not to hear the criticism than to read it and start to you know navel gaze and wonder what's wrong with us. So how did you handle that, or how do you handle that? when you get feedback on something you threw your heart into, you know, yeah. the meal service, the conference that you hosted, the book that you wrote, I'm sure you probably have a one-star review. Uh, definitely not from me, but what do you do with that? How do, what, what happens inside Will when, when you get that kind of feedback? Well, different things depending on the, the dynamic of the relationship between me and the person it's coming from. Um, Fair. I mean, I remember when I was coming up, I always craved feedback from my bosses. Right? I wanted to grow through my career. I knew that the only way to do it was for the people above me in the hierarchy to think I was doing a good job. So tell me what I'm not doing well so I can fix it. Yeah. 
Um, I'm working with a trainer right now for the first time in my life. I've never done that. I've never like, like physical trainer working out. Physical that kind trainer, of stuff? like yeah, yeah. I'm, cool. I said I'm 44 years old. I have two kids. Like I want to be in good shape. Tell me how to be in good shape. Um, and this guy, his name is Sam. He is unbelievable. And if I'm doing an exercise wrong, he's gonna be like, "Hey, stop doing that!" Like, no, like keep your body level. Like, stop moving your elbow like that. Tuck it in. Like, and he's not like, "Hey, if you don't mind, I wouldn't. I would really love if you could." He just says it very directly. Um. By the way, then the moment I do it the right way, he's like, "There you go. Great job." You know, and by the way, that's exactly how feedback should work, right? Like in a very unemotional, direct way, call out the problem when they get it right, celebrate it with a bit of emotion, right? That's the, I think, mm. the, the circle of, of feedback. <clears throat> and I, I soak it up. I want every little bit of that from him because I'm working with him for a reason. I want to achieve results. And I know in the absence of his feedback, I won't. Um, when... It's something that's more emotional. My conference, my book, the meal, something that I've it, like poured myself into. Um, the end result is the same. Sometimes there's just a, like a left turn and a right turn and another left turn to get there, right? Like we got an email the day, like three days after the welcome conference and I got so many great text messages and emails. Mm. And this is the actually... Sorry for the, um, whatever aside here, but I think one of the things that's so funny when I think about myself and my relationship to receiving feedback is if someone sends me an email telling me that something I did was good, I lose interest halfway through. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm not learning anything in this. Like, Great. Thank you. Let's move on. Like, tell me something that can make me better. That's going to be the thing I'm really, which by the way, I'm trying to work on because I, I do think you need to allow yourself the grace to celebrate the, the good stuff. Um, then someone tells me I did something bad. This email I got about welcome conference. I read it and it was forwarded to me by someone on my team and I was on a plan and I just deleted the email. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and then five minutes later, I said, Will. And then I went into my trash and undeleted the email. And I knew I was going to undelete it the moment I deleted it, but I needed to like, it just a little, and I'll tell you what the feedback was. And I'll tell you what I learned from it. Um, That there were too many speakers that were not speaking directly to hospitality. Mm. And I deleted the email because I was like, well, this person's wrong. Yeah, because I spent so long. Like every everyone on that stage was speaking about hospitality and the entire way in which welcome has evolved. Is it's not as literal. It's not like here's how you decant a bottle of wine and here's how you welcome someone into your restaurant. It was a the leading child psychologist talking about empathy and assuming the goodness in others. That is mm. profoundly hospitable to me. It was Don Miller talking about being the guide. That is profoundly hospitable to me. Um, but so that's why I deleted it. The reason I undeleted it was everything I'm talking about. I want to get better. And if that was their perception, something in it is real. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do next year as a result of that person's critical email, which I'm so grateful for is I've in the past, I would go up onto stage every couple speakers and summarize my takeaways of those speakers Hmm. to bring it back to the core. And I didn't do that this year. Hmm. And I can tell, and I did it organically before from this point forward, I will do it with intention. Like there needs to be a tie back where someone is leading everyone to the point that we brought them up there to make if they don't get there on their own. And next year's conference will be better because of that email that person took a risk in sending it and I'm grateful that they did. I think there's a lot of leaders who are probably relieved that you still have the emotional journey and haven't <laughs> figured it out. Interesting what you said though. I I tend to stop reading compliments halfway through too. 
Uh, I think I think that's probably a therapy session for you and one for me separately <laughs> that we have to chase down. Why why do we not believe the praise, but we're so quick to go to the criticism? And I think you're right. Like when I was reading the spreadsheet where all the uh, reviews were were cataloged for me, I'm like, but what you don't understand is what I was trying to do. And then yes. I'm like, don't 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 play that game. Like just listen. And, and my group, I let them, it was 200 hand-selected leaders. We wanted it really small. And I'm like, you're adults. I'm going to ask a lot of questions, not give a lot of direction. You're going to figure it out. And the number one piece of feedback was we want more content mm. from you. And we want a few more practical things along the way. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. And so when we do it again next year, we're going to make adjustments. But yeah, yeah that emotional journey is hard. And I guess... As long as you undelete the deleted email, you're probably still going to win it this long term, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't get easier. Uh, that's 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 really good. I want to. You were on Craig Rochelle's podcast, and I was listening, and uh, that was one of the things you talked about: criticism as investment, praise as affirmation. But you said a couple of other things: high creativity and high competitiveness. Can you talk about that pairing? High creativity, high competitiveness. <clears throat> I don't remember the context that I was talking about it on oh. his, but um, do you, can you can you give me context to make sure I'm talking about? I it wish the way I that could. You want? I'm just looking at my notes. So let me give you a couple of pairings that I thought were interested: high creativity, high competitiveness, um, control, and collaboration was another mm-hmm. one that I picked up on. Um, because you're right. I mean, if you're dealing with a whole lot of people who, as you point out, in unreasonable hospitality, are not making six figures a year. Just yeah. by definition, the industry can't support it. You need a lot of collaboration, a lot of ownership, but you also have to have control so the restaurant doesn't go in a whole other direction yes. or get way off off base. So that was a really interesting pairing. Maybe we can focus on that collaboration versus and control. Well, I think so. Now it's you're starting to bring me back a little bit to it. So I think like the whole like conflicting goals thing I think is just so important. Um, Mm. And I mean, excellence and hospitality, conflicting goals, right? Those two things are not friends. It's easier to be just excellent, easier to be just hospitable, harder to do the two at the same time. Like think about it. Like I could manage a restaurant where everyone in the dining room is super, super happy and extraordinarily warm. If I didn't care about them executing the details at a high level, right? All I need to we do is- We all love each other. Yeah, we're like- so mediocre. The, we're the, so mediocre. The joke is if all you do is give your team back rubs in the service station, they're going to be great on the floor. The moment you have to be like, hey, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. You didn't do this. Like, <laughs> similarly, it's easy to be excellent. If you put the fear of God in your team- that they're going to get screamed at if they make a mistake. They're probably going to make a lot less mistakes, but you cannot be your most hospitable self if you're living in a place of fear, right? Doing the two Mm -hmm. things simultaneously is just harder. I think there are plenty of creatives. There are plenty of creative people, and there are plenty of competitive people. Mm -hmm. But if you really look around, a lot of the people that you would consider to be the most creative aren't necessarily so competitive and the people that are the most competitive aren't necessarily the most creative when you can be both creative and competitive at the same time when you can allow yourself to believe that both sides of both of those sides of of who you are are decent and awesome and necessary and you can feed and indulge both sides of them that's that's when you become the kind of person that changes the world, right? Like mm-hmm. Steve Jobs was creative and competitive. Michael Jordan yes. was creative and competitive. Um, and there's plenty of creative people who think competitive people are jerks. And there's plenty of creative competitive <laughs> people who think creative people are wusses, right? And like, <laughs> yeah, functionally useless. Yeah. And I think you need, I think you need a little bit of both to, to really to rise to that next level. I think control versus collaboration, I mean, that will be my, uh, the thing that torments me. Um, and I think control and collaboration is hospitality and excellence a little bit. I think there, there's 
a, a ton of parallel there. I am an unbelievably obsessive compulsive person. Like I'm anal retentive. It's, it's a superpower and a villain origin story all wrapped up into one. Um, when it comes to excellence, I know exactly what right looks like and I want everyone to do it exactly that way all the time. And um, yet at the same time, I love creating cultures of ownership and empowerment. And I know that people bring their best selves to the job when they feel they have the ability to creatively impact the work itself. And those two things do not go together well at all. And it's a real balancing act to understand what things need to be consistent hmm. and interrogate that list down such as such that it's as short as possible and then empower people to make the rest of it their own. Yeah. So I'd love to explore that journey a little bit more, Will, because normally what would happen, obviously there's a lot of self-awareness and self-regulation happening in getting to the place where you're able to scale this, build a restaurant that became number one in the world because most people who are obsessive, compulsive, you know, micromanaging details, you have a restaurant with two staff who yeah. don't have other options <laughs> and a few clients, right? You can, you can micromanage your organization into nothing. So quickly, just or you, have, or you have a big, big staff with a ton of turnover. Exactly. Yeah, Where people are too. fine putting themselves through that for some measure of time and taking what they can from you, but then they don't want to do any. They want to have anything to do with you anymore, and then they move on. Right. So you see it. I still remember my first uh, conversation with Horst Schultz on this podcast where he talked about the blessing and the curse of seeing everything, mm. right? Founder of the Ritz-Carlton. He notices every detail, where the napkin was laid, how the cutlery is laid out, exactly what side they serve from. And, you know, I go to a restaurant, it's like it was good or bad, but I go to a church, I can point out every yes. mistake I see, particularly in my own work. How did you manage that very natural tendency with collaboration where the whole team felt empowered and you got that list to be a very, very short list? Because I think that's a tension so many people listening to this struggle with, Will. Well, okay. So the first thing I want to say is at the end of the day, you can, you can have both, mm -hmm. right? So every time a knife is put down, I want to see it put down the same way. Every time um, we plate the duck, it better be facing you in the exact same way and the puree better be exactly here on the plate. And every time we do all these different things, the consistency is, is a very, very, very big part of a winning formula. Mm -hmm. And then controlling consistency is important. I don't, however, think that I need to be the one that decides where, how all those things are done. Right. I think if you open up the doors to collaboration and making decisions, then it's not like designed by committee every single day, every pe everyone walks in the door, right? It's just about inviting more people, as many as possible, to sit with you around the table so that you can collectively decide what right looks like. Mm -hmm. Um. And to be clear, even then, it's not designed by committee. I think the way I believe collaboration should work in a big group is you sit down at the table, you let everyone speak their mind, you allow for a reasonable amount of time for debate and discourse and engagement. And at the end of the day, people do crave leadership and someone needs to make a decision at the end of that meeting. People want conviction. and They want to know that things are actually getting done and not just endlessly debated. Um. Then on the other side, I think there's, okay, the plate needs to go down in the exact same way. The knife does need to go down in the same way. How the food is described, well, that shouldn't be the exact same way for two reasons. One, then a server is becoming an actor. They're just resetting lines as opposed to being a human being. 
using their own words. Two, you're actually giving a worse version of service because part of great hospitality is reading the people you're serving to identify what they want from you in that moment. Some people want you to say, here's the beef, medium rare, and leave. There's someone else that wants to say, this is the beef, medium rare, it was came from a cattle farm in Montana. The farmer's name is Duke. He plays the cows, Beethoven, every single, like whatever. You know, like <laughs> some people want the entire chapter read to them. Um, I, think, I think really what it comes down to is when the thing actually influences the human experience, you probably want to work super hard to control as little about it as possible. Oh, that's interesting. When it impacts the human experience. Can you say more about that? What, what does that mean? Like, the words that we are using to engage with one another, the little things that I am going to be doing for you that are reacting to the things I learned about you as a human, I guess you're right to, to push me to explain it more because the human experience could be, everything could be a part of the human experience. I mean, when it's mm-hmm. less logistical and it's more emotional mm-hmm. and emotional, let's, let's frame that word describing the beef tenderloin on a plate is not emotional, but like the way in which you're doing it is reacting to some emotion you're receiving from the people you're doing it for. Mm -hmm. And whether you're doing it succinctly or elaborately, whether you have a serious look on your face or a smile on your face, right? Like you're reading the emotion and the energy at the table and you're responding to that in a way that you believe will make the people you're serving feel the most served will give them the ability to feel the most connected to you. And by definition with one another as well. Um, (laughs) When you like, okay, I'll give you an example at most restaurants, mine in the beginning, there were a list of words that you don't use. You don't use the word dude. You don't use the word bro. You don't say, are (laughs) we still working on it? It, We tried to interrogate that list of words that you didn't use down to be as small as humanly possible. Because here's the reality. If someone on my team just uses the word dude, if he calls people dude, then every, if that's like part of his vernacular on a regular basis, Every moment that he's actively trying to not say a word that he always uses every minute that he's not in the restaurant, he's less present with the people he's talking to. Right. Um, rather, I would say to the team, hey, if you use the word dude, I'm fine with you saying dude here, but you need to earn informality with the guest before you do. Mm. So you mm. need to like, and you know, I, I wrote this metaphor in the book, but when you meet your partner's father for the first time, you call them Mr. Whatever. And then eventually one day they say, please call me by my first name. Then, you know, you've earned informality. You need to get there with the guest as quickly as possible. And then just be you, just be profoundly you. Because if I'm giving you a set of rules, that's not allowing you to be you. You're spending so much time trying to follow those rules that you're not actually fully you, right? Like, um, and that is part of the human experience. It's being hmm. uniquely human. I don't know. I'm, you, I'm, I'm all over the place here. So no, tell me if is, it's not making sense. This is making a lot of sense and it is never easy and it's a constant dance. If you were starting all over again, what would you do differently? Hmm. Gosh, I mean, honestly, not much. I, That's fun. It's a fun answer. Well, the reason for that is because, I mean, yeah, I could answer like, well, I wouldn't have done this because, man, that was hard. And that took us down a side road for a while. And then we had to double back and we made this mistake. But, I mean, I'm of the camp that every mistake you make 
helps you become a better version of yourself. And it makes me nervous to think about all the great things I learned, like how many of the great things I learned, I wouldn't have learned had I not made the mistake that prompted them. Um, yeah, was there anything that took too high a cost? Because uh, I'm thinking I can like the biggest defining point in my life was burnout that I hit around the age of 40. And it was deeply painful. And I look back on that now almost 19 years ago. And I'm like, yeah, but it paved the way to all the progress I've made in my life since then. And it's a big part of yeah. why I do what I do and what I do. So, I mean, I understand that. On the other hand, Looking back on it, I'm like, the, the, the chit was too expensive for my family and my wife and the people closest to me. And so if I could rewind the tape, I would have taken my personal health and well-being more seriously and mm. my boundaries more seriously. I'm just, and if not, well, I got lots of other questions. Well, well we can no, move on. But, but even there, like, let me, let me, let me ask you something. Because um, you seem like you, you're living in a pretty beautifully balanced way, or at least the energy you put out into the world would make people believe that to be true. I, th I think it's true privately and publicly. I'm not saying it can't get better, yeah. but I'm at a place where nine days out of 10, I'm in a pretty good place. With and like on a the, scale from one to 10, where would you rank yourself? Yeah, I would say I'm an eight or a nine. 10 is for heaven. Um, so I, I would say most days I'm an eight or a nine. And at my worst, I actually didn't have a good week last week. Variety of things happening personally. I was a five or a six. Um, but I led for a number of years, maybe with a with a three or a four at times. Yeah, so, so yeah. If, if you were to ask your family, hmm. hey, what would you prefer? Would you prefer that for the entire, for my entire life, I was at a six? Or would you prefer that I had to go down to a three for some measure of time such that for the rest of my years, I could live between an eight and a nine? What do you think they'd say? Hmm. I'm a bit emotional. That's a great question. And I've had that conversation with my adult sons who are 32 and 28 several times. And you've helped me clarify something that is really important because I feel very bad about me not being as attentive hmm. in my 30s as I might have been as a dad. And I didn't skip all their games. I mean, I was there, I was them. But you know, when you're there, but you're like, nah, I'm thinking about other stuff, that was me. And they have said ad nauseum, dad, it wasn't that bad. Dad, it wasn't that bad. And I think, honestly, without hesitation, they would say, we'll take you at a three for a few years so that you can be eight or nine for most of the rest of our lives. Wow. What a framing. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you, man. It's my pleasure. That's a gift, man. That's a gift, Will. I'm sorry. I, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me in a, in a good way. That's a very good, and you know, Christians, we're really good at beating ourselves up with guilt. So, you know, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, a lot of my closest uh, friends are Jewish, and I think they, they might say they got you guys they, beat. Maybe they've got me beat. Maybe they got me beat. Fair, 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 Will. Yeah, but you know, that is a really interesting framing. So thank you. What a, what a gift. Um, Can... Uh, Anything else on that? Or else I've, I've got a few more questions. I think that's Let, right. Let's that talk one. about reinvention. Okay. So 11 Madison Park, uh, you left after a number of years becoming number one in the world and you've reinvented yourself. These mm. days, as far as I know, last time we talked, you're not running a restaurant day to day. Is that fair? That's fair. Uh, you're doing the welcome conference. You wrote a book. You're doing a lot of public speaking. Um, what are you learning about reinvention? I'll tell you, this has been the most wild ride. Huh. And, and gosh, I think there's so many people. I lost a couple of really, really good friends during COVID. Mm. Um, I lost some money during COVID. I think a lot of people lost a bunch of different things. And 
And yet I, I do not think I'm, an, I'm alone that there's something I feel incredible gratitude to COVID for. Um, I think the pandemic gave a lot of people different things, whether it was a collective kind of reminder of our innate need for human connections and yeah. let's not take some of those relationships for granted as much as we may have before. Um, whether that's just setting aside time to pursue the friends or family that we love, or even with our, you know, intimate family, just the beauty of sitting around the dinner table together on a, on a regular basis. Um, mm. When I sold the company, I had about two days of unbelievable celebration and then an immediate identity crisis. Like, wait a minute. What did I just do? Who am I? What, uh, I'm the mm. restaurant guy who is a restaurant guy without restaurants. And, and then started frantically, aggressively raising money, building a team, getting ready to open restaurants. And when COVID hit, I was literally, this is not a bombastic statement, it's, it's literal, a week away from signing three restaurant leases in New York City. Um, and then I moved, uh, the, it was just me and my wife at that point, our dog, up to our place in the country for mm. what we thought was going to be a few weeks. That turned into a few <laughs> months. Um, for the first couple months, I was keeping all those deals warm, talking to my team, talking to the investors. And, and then one day I said, wait, what am I doing? COVID gave me a gift. The gift of rather than running back to do the thing I'd always done, to rather take a little bit of time and decide what I wanted to do next. Um, by the way, I could have taken that time and gone back to doing what I'd always done, but I still would have been making that choice again, which is powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Choosing free Making, agent. Yeah, like mm -hmm. choosing to do it as opposed to just reverting to it. And what's funny is I wrote the book to help me make that choice. Hmm. Um, I was like, maybe I should write this book. I've been thinking about writing it. Then maybe this is the right time to write it because, hey, no matter what I choose to do next, if I force myself to articulate for others, what my non-negotiables are, I'll be better at embodying them going forward. I'll be better at compelling my team to embrace them. The better you are at articulating an idea, the better you become at compelling those around you to embrace it. And just based on the way I wrote the book, it was, it was a narrative structure, right? And so if I walk back down the path I've just been on, It'll help me choose where I want to walk next. Hmm. And in a hilarious turn of fate, writing the book, well, that ended up becoming the thing I did next. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's given me, well, that's the story. I haven't answered the question yet, though. What have I learned about reinvention? It's never too late to reinvent yourself. I used to say, a piece of advice I always used to give people is don't run away from something, run towards something. And like people I would talk to, it's funny, you get older and you regret advice you've given in the past that were unhappy in their jobs. I'd be like, don't just quit your job. Like start thinking about what you want to do next and like, when you know what you want to run towards, then quit your job and run towards it. And I'm sure that's pragmatic advice. And I think it's probably still good some of the time, but if, if you believe in yourself, if you work hard, like here's the thing with the book, I gave everything to that book in the same way I gave everything to the restaurants, right? Like you need to approach everything in the way that you do. Well, anything. Um, but if you believe in yourself and you work hard, 
and you understand what you're passionate about and you lean into those passions, there's always another chapter ahead of you if you're open to reading it. Um, so I would just say for anyone out there who's maybe not happy or not finding fulfillment in what they do, but feeling like they're wearing some golden handcuffs and they can't leave because they're in a place that too much of their identity is wrapped up in what they do, or they're making too much money or people think they're cool for it. You can find all of those things again. And if you do, and you find just profound fulfillment along with it, highly recommend it. Hmm. Hmm. One of the things you've done in the reinvention is you got involved in TV, uh, the bear. I mean, it was a, it was a show my wife and I watched in season one, before anybody had heard of it. And then it really took off in season two. And you and another podcast alumnus, Brian Koppelman, are on the show. I had the chance to interview Brian a few years ago through Mutual Friends, and you're on the show. And I'm like looking at the credits going, Will's on this. This is amazing. <laughs> how did how did that happen? How did you get connected with the, the bear, which is, I guess now the most, award, it's not a comedy. That's its category. I guess I it know. is. It is funny. But the most awarded comedy in the history of television. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. So I spent a little bit of time with Chris Storer, the showrunner, yeah. the director, the creator of the show, before season one came out. Hmm. Okay. How did you guys connect? Mutual um, friends? Or? Someone introduced us. But, uh, sometime. I mean, like, uh, one 90-minute phone call. Mm -hmm. Where someone was like, hey, if you're doing the show, you should just, like, spend some time with Will. Like, ask him a bunch of questions. Let him say some stuff. Just so that you, like, are steeped in restaurant-y stuff. Um, and, and then I didn't even think about it again. And I actually found a deleted item, a deleted email from him, which is strange because mm. I'm very disciplined with emails and somehow I missed this one. Um, years later, that was like, hey, bud, that show we talked about, the first season's coming out in a couple weeks click the link below if you want to get a sneak preview. And it was him sending me season one of the bear. And I just totally <laughs> missed it. Uh, um, and so I didn't, um, and then season one came out and I didn't watch it um, because for me, television, I love, love television. And television for me is an escape at the end of the night. It's like me putting the world on pause and you can't put the world on pause if you're watching a show about your world. True. Um, but then someone introduced us, re like reconnected us, and Chris and I started to become friends. Um, and so then I watched season one. I was like, oh man, this is really good. I like this show. Then right before season two came out, he called me and said, hey, they were working out of New York City. They were doing the, the post-production in New York City. He said, can you come out to our offices next week. I want to show you something. I was like, yeah. So I went out there and he showed me episode seven forks, which is the one based on mm -hmm. the hot dog story that my book is featured in. And he showed me the whole episode. I had no idea what I was walking into. And it was wild. And I think he was showing me because he was excited for me to see it and also to be like, hey, is that cool? We kind of... <laughs> we yeah, because your book, your book's featured in yeah. it. And, and the it's story, based on the hot yeah. dog story. Yeah. Um. And I was like, yeah, this is amazing. Of course it's cool. And then that same day, he told me that season three, it was no longer going to be the beef shop. They were making it into the proper restaurant. He asked me to come on as a writer and a producer. Um, and I said, of course. It's kind of, it's funny, this question dovetails in the last one. The first season of my life was very, very goal-oriented. When I was a, a kid, I wanted to own a restaurant in New York City. Once I had a restaurant in New York City, I wanted it to be the number one in the world. Like It was very, very linear. Every choice I made was in pursuit of a goal. In this new season, my second mountain, if we're using David Brooks' language, I'm actually less focused on single goals and more just open to whatever life puts in front of me so long as it checks three boxes, 
I feel like I can learn something. I work alongside people I like having fun and I make money. If it's those three things, then it's for sure something I want to do. Hmm. Um, and so this one came up. I was like, that checks all three boxes. Let's do it. Um, and it was just a blast. I love learning. To your point, or the question before about high competitiveness, high creative, um, from people who embrace those two approaches. And obviously, you don't become the most award winning comedy in quotes show in history if you're not both creative and competitive, right? And to just learn about how they approached the culture of that show, not just on set, but in the writing room how collaborative it was, how there's a lot of people who deserve to have really big egos who check those egos at the door and come in looking to learn from one another and work alongside one another. It was a really cool experience. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and it made me, I learned that I could impact a lot more people through books than I could restaurants. And you can impact a lot more people through TV than through books. (laughs) <laughs> I guess so. Um, I guess so. How true to life is a, a scenario? Like, you know, part of it, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of family dynamics. Addiction is a big part of that show. And conflict, honestly, high conflict. You don't strike me as a high conflict person. Um, any any thoughts on how that uh, portrays reality or is it just very well dramatized for television? I mean, I think it's everything in it is rooted in in, in reality. And I think some of it is dramatized to a point, but there are restaurants. I mean, my restaurant was never that dramatic, but there were moments that were very dramatic, not dissimilar yeah. to what's portrayed there. I mean, the thing, mm. man, I'll tell you the thing I loved the most about episode seven, the one where my book was in it is one of the things that I try so hard to communicate through the book, through the written word. And it goes back to our conversation around this idea that, everyone has hospitality in them. It's just a matter of someone inspiring it out of them is that once you do it, once you feel that unbelievable feeling of seeing the look on another person's face, when they receive a gift, you're responsible for giving them, you can get hooked and it can unlock the best part of you and make you want to do that over and over and over again. And um, it's hard to fully paint that picture for people. Mm. But watching Richie start that apprenticeship at that restaurant, so jaded and over it. And Not exactly a writer it. either, his no. character. No. <laughs> and then doing the thing with the deep dish pizza, their riff on the hot dog and seeing the look on their face and then racing home, listening to Love Story by Taylor Swift and then pacing around his apartment reading the book. Like, that's real. And I've seen it happen to so many people before mm. and they did it in a way that is so perfect and so beautiful. And, um, and I'm grateful to them for, mm. for painting that picture better than I was able to paint it myself. Well, we've covered a lot, uh, so far. Is there anything you would, a message, a thought you want to get out to leaders before we wrap up? It's been so rich. Um, No, I guess this is the thing I'd say. I've talked to a lot of companies from pretty much every industry over the past two years. And everyone believes in everything I talk about until the part of the conversation where it comes to resource and investment. And yes, Like I said before, it's not about how much you spend on this stuff. It's about how thoughtful you are. But Mm. anyone who's ever done anything of consequence understands that no big idea will ever take root absent resource. And when anyone is thinking about how to make a product better, it's obvious and understood and very intuitive that you invest in better things, better ingredients, better parts to make the product better. 
And yet as much as everyone wants to have better hospitality, to improve their customer service, people are so reticent to put resource behind it. And I've seen this for years. I've seen restaurants that spend $30 million on their construction and then cheap out when it comes to the people or the training or inspiring of those people. Mm. I've seen it with real estate developments where they spend hundreds of millions of dollars And then you walk in and the security guard is wearing a cheap suit. And How proud can you be of the job you're in if they're not even willing to buy you a nice suit to wear while you're in it? When you know that the marble you're standing on costs you 10 years of a salary at the least. And so for a leader out there, if you're inspired by this stuff, being inspired It's only going to get you so far. And I would just encourage people to put their money where their mouths are. And I'm not saying you need to mortgage the house. But if you agree that no plant will ever grow without water, then you understand that no new idea will ever take root in the absence of resource. And I encourage you to water the flowers a little bit with this stuff and, and look at the impact it have. because by the way, I, I believe it's some of the smartest money you can spend. Oh man, that is, that is a great thought and not divorced from church world. There's more than a few lead, leaders listening here who are on teams where we just spent $10 million on a new facility, but we can only pay the kids ministry director a pittance. And yeah. I think that's a mistake. I think you got to invest in your people you got to invest in 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 the whole project and the environment, the culture you want to create. Well in, said. In, in thirty years, nobody, and I can say this with absolute confidence, zero people are going to remember how expensive the stone on the entrance was. They're not going to care where the wood came from. They're not going to remember if that doorknob was some gorgeous brass one or something from Home Depot, but they are going to remember the impact that that pastor had on them. So Mm -hmm. are you investing in the things that actually impact people or are you investing in the things that don't? And if you're not, you need to stop and ask yourself why. Mm. Well, people are going to want to track with you. I subscribe to your newsletter. Where's an easy place to find you these days? Um, yeah, my newsletter premium comes out every two weeks. You can sign up for that at unreasonablehospitality.com. And then I'm at uh, W. Gadara on Instagram and LinkedIn. Yeah, this was so fun. Well, this is great. Yeah, we, we, we did manage to fill an hour and a bit on round two, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Thank you so much, man. I look forward to the next one. Me too.